Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> I really, I really appreciate that. That sounds pretty good. If you have any sense, we'll now have dinner. That was. Uh, it's really terrific to be here with old friends and to. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try to speak up here to see so many. More than one of you have heard me before in a different venue, and so you should have known better. So I appreciate it. It's. I appreciate Amanda. I, I appreciate Jim Baisley's making all the arrangements. Uh, Charles uh, Carl Mazzola. I appreciate Diane Shelton um, getting us all checked in, uh, but more importantly, I appreciate her husband, Harry, uh, taking the evening to uh, uh, assist in all this, and this is Harry Shelton's birthday, so happy birthday, Harry! <laughs> that uh, I built reactors. I appreciate all uh, you nuclear engineers being here. I've built a couple of reactors. They go critical in milliseconds. Um, they produce a lot of energy very efficiently, not in a fashion that the NRC would approve of, um, but it, uh, the physics is the same. And that's what I want to talk about, and I want to talk about uh, more to the point that, that nuclear reactors and the re power industry are not necessarily conducive to proliferation. They can be connected, but they need not be. So. Let's go back. Let's go back 50 years. Let's start back when John Kennedy was becoming president of the United States, and Kennedy foresaw 50 years ago. He talked about his concern of 15 or 20 nuclear states within 20 years, and in fact, what has happened is there's only nine. That is an enormous success story. Uh, that that as a result of that, I'd like to talk about who climbed down out of the tree because there's a dozen would be nuclear states that did not go nuclear or that quit. Uh, and there are others that are hanging uh, on the edge. And let's talk about why nations go nuclear and why some of them quit, because it's really interesting. Start with uh, the seven nuclear aspirant states that quit uh, either of their own free will or for political reasons. <clears throat> not well appreciated, but the first would be nuclear powers after the US were Switzerland and Sweden. Right after World War II, uh, Switzerland and Sweden had not been bombed away. They had wealth. They had scientific talent. Eisenhower came from Zurich. Uh, Lisa Meitner, the inventor of fission, really, was living in Sweden. Both those countries looked at the Hiroshima and saw nuclear weapons as the path to maintain their new neutrality between East and West. And so both Switzerland and Sweden embarked on a nuclear weapon program. I've seen documentations from the 60s. The Swiss were planning seven tests under the Alps. They were focusing on an inventory of 250 weapons. The Swedes have a similar program. But the happy story is, in the 60s, they began to look at what it was costing, what it was costing politically, and how those same resources could be expended in protecting their country in better ways, building submarines to patrol their own coasts, for instance. And therefore, in, this, in the late 60s, Switzerland and Sweden quit. 
all of on their own. They were among the first signers of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, another pair of uh, nations that were thinking about going nuclear were Argentina and Brazil. Argentina and Brazil in the 70s, once the age of the military dictators was upon those countries, had the same cozy relationship as India and Pakistan today. They embarked on nuclear weapons programs starting in 1978. They had reactors that they bought from the U.S. and Europe, uh, and they had an energetic nuclear weapons program. With the ending of the Cold War, uh, basically things winding down in the 80s, however, and the coming of democracy to those countries, the USA was able to lean on them to convince them that having nuclear weapons really was very wasteful. Uh, and so in 1991, they signed uh, a mutual inspection agreement. And in 1994, they signed the Treaty of Latileco, uh, which turned South America into a nuclear-free zone. But those two countries were marching down the nuclear path. And Brazil is an industrial heavyweight. And they could go nuclear whenever they want to. <clears throat> now, in addition to those, there are three uh, states that, that thought about going nuclear or marched down the path, or actually did, that I would call pariah states that went nuclear for interesting reasons. The first one is Taiwan. Taiwan decided to go nuclear in 1971 because they were voted off the island. <laughs> Specifically, they were voted off the island of Manhattan. Taiwan, the government in Taipei, had represented China, the Republican of China, uh, uh, until 1971. In 71, uh, the UN voted to vote, recognize Beijing as the government of China, uh, and Taiwan was dismissed from the Security Council. That gave their leadership great concern uh, that their allies were going to walk away, that they were going to be abandoned, and that nuclear weapons were the way to keep mainland China at bay. And therefore, the uh, Taiwanese embarked on a, on a weapons program. They began to produce plutonium by 1998. They had produced 250 pounds of plutonium. Now the happy story is, with the, with the, the coming of the mid-90s, the U.S. really focused their attention on Taiwan and to a lesser degree South Korea and explained it to them. Don't do this. Lean on them. Carrots and sticks are an expression I will use throughout the evening, but it really <coughs> means threats, bribes, cajolery, psychological uh, warfare, and all sorts of things. But in 1998, we convinced the Taiwanese that having nuclear weapons was not in their best interest, and they quit. They sold that 250 pounds of plutonium to us, and it's now in the U.S. system. South Africa, even more interesting. South Africa developed nuclear weapons. South Africa program started in 1974. The South African nuclear weapons program started in 1974 in Lisbon. In Lisbon? How could that be? Well, because in 1974, the Portuguese era of dictators, Mr. Salazar at uh, all from the wartime years, were overthrown in a bloodless coup. But in 1974, the parliament, the new parliament in Portugal, said no more, we're not going to support the colonies. And therefore, they uh, withdrew their support of, uh, withdrew troops uh, from Mozambique, uh, from the other um, states that were bordering on Angola, that were bordering on South Africa. That means those those former colonies became independent nations, which immediately became a haven uh, for the ANC that wanted to overthrow the South African government. And therefore, in 74, the South African government decided that having nuclear weapons would be some way to uh, gain stature and to have something to threaten other people with. They also acquired an interesting ally, which is interesting and part of what I want to talk about is this connection that goes on all the time. 1973, the Israelis had a close call in the Yom Kippur War. They managed, they were taken by surprise, they managed to prevail due to U.S. logistical intercession. But after the 73 Yom Kippur War, the Israelis decided that they'd had a few A-bombs in inventory, but they decided they really needed to go upscale thermonuclears, neutron bombs, and so forth. And therefore, in 74, the Israelis and the South Africans embarked on a joint nuclear weapons program. The Israelis were to provide uh, basically the technology uh, and specifically tritium, which they were producing. Uh, and the South Africans were to pr pr provide the real estate for tests, uh, as well as uranium, which they were producing uh, in great quantities as a byproduct of mining gold. 
And so South Africa marched down the uh, nuclear path. By 1982, they produced their first weapon called Melba. Uh, it was basically a, a World War II uh, little boy uh, gun type uh, HEU weapon. Uh, but they were producing one a year. By 1989, uh, they had produced six weapons. The South Africans had six nuclear weapons in inventory. But happily, the ending of the Cold War brought about changes. The ending of the Cold War meant that the Soviets could no more support Cuban troops in Angola. It meant that the threat to the neighboring uh, countries began to fall apart. And in that year, Mr. de Klerk came to power in South Africa to declare we're going to end apartheid and the nuclear weapons program altogether. He decided to change the country. South Africa closed down their program. They dismantled the weapons. The uranium was recycled into the uh, to the power community. Uh, and in September of 91, Mr. de Klerk had a full disclosure to the IAEA that Africa, South Africa had no more nuclear weapons. But they had had six. Another interesting would-be nuclear state is Libya. Libya is run by a true cuckoo berry, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Muammar Gaddafi. Mr. Gaddafi came to power in 69, and in a few years the rise of the oil price got him interested in terrorism. And so starting in the mid-70s, Mr. Gaddafi started supporting the IRA. He started blowing up airplanes over Scotland. And in 1986, he had a nightclub in Berlin blown up that was populated, that was attended by Americans. The American president took a dim view of that and decided to do something about it. And so in 1986, uh, the US Air Force staged a massive raid on Tripoli and Benghazi. The intent was to kill off Mr. Gaddafi and his staff and his family. Uh, that uh, the, those raids were uh, successful in killing his daughter, but not Mr. Gaddafi, but he was understandingly annoyed by that. Now, and the point of the story is, you know, you really need to think through when you're dealing with proliferator that they do react. 86, we bomb Tripoli and Benghazi, we kill Gaddafi's daughter, and things go quiet. And the conventional wisdom is, well, Gaddafi has learned his lesson, no more terrorism, no more blowing up airplanes. Wrong. 1986, Gaddafi decided to go nuclear. And so he began to embark on a nuclear weapons program. He had all the money that he could possibly need to do that. For four years, he did business with a bunch of, of European techno hustlers. But in 1990, he connected with AQ Khan. And AQ Khan began to sell him centrifuges and began to bring all sorts of neat hardware into Libya. And so the, the program rolled for uh, almost uh, a decade until 2001. <clears throat> now the interesting thing about how it ended in Libya is in 2001, as everyone here knows, the events of 9-11 happened in New York and the U.S. responded very promptly in, in sending troops into Afghanistan. And the ability of the U.S. Army to deal with Afghanistan impressed Mr. Gaddafi. He thought about that and his advisors thought about it. 2003, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, while the subsequent occupation was bungled badly, the invasion was carried off such that the U.S. Army dispensed with the most powerful army in the Arab world in two weeks. Mr. Gaddafi noted, but the 30 ingredient was his son. That's also important in that the, the, nuclear, the nuclear powers think had, do have second generations. Mr. Gaddafi's son did not live in a tent in the desert. He lives in Vienna. And he lives in Vienna and made it clear to his father that he didn't want to blow up London. He wanted a bank there. <laughs> and, and furthermore, we, we, our oil industry is in shambles. The oil production never got back to what it was when Gaddafi took over. And therefore, the family decided, with some very energetic and capable intercession by US and British intelligence type, drinking a lot of tea in Libya, convinced Gaddafi uh, uh, in December of 2003 to quit. And so in 2003, Muammar Gaddafi rolled back his program. He had full disclosure to the IAEA, um, and you know, he disclosed the program. He said, here's the centrifuges. Uh, all that stuff has now been moved to Oak Ridge. Here's a bag full of drawings of how to build a nuclear weapon that he got from AQ Khan, who had gotten the dr drawings from the Chinese, and the Libyans quit. Now he's still strange and he still has strange friends, but nonetheless, Libya has decided to not be a nuclear power, which is a great success story.